Okay. People don't understand what the European Union is. They don't understand how it's governed. They don't know who are the people who are running it. But they know that they weren't chosen by the people. And so when they see the results are less than perfect, they say, who do we blame? And they don't know who to blame because they don't know who these people are. When I started out as a young environmental activist, I had no idea that I should end up as a watchdog in the Brussels machinery. But I was stunned to discover how fragile the political decision-making process is and to realize how easily it can be manipulated. There is a dark force behind this machinery, an entire industry operating in the shadow often in secrecy and very confidential. This industry is the lobby industry. Amendment 28, those in favour, those against, abstentions rejected. Paragraph 72, those in For 20 years now, I've been fighting to uncover who are these people who are pulling the strings of the EU decisions? How do they operate? And how are they linked to the EU's political elite? Oh yes, good evening. Um, I'd like to speak to Raffaele, please. Oh, he's not there, no. Well, listen, I'd like to, to leave a message for, for tomorrow. I just wanted to confirm the meeting uh, that we have fixed. Um, my name is uh, Mr. Kernais, Pascal Kernais, K-E-R-N-E-I-S. Yes, from, from the European Services Forum, ESF. Yes, and we have a meeting tomorrow, but uh, I didn't get time today to, to confirm, so I wanted to do it now. Is it okay? Yeah, thank you very much. Bye bye. Well, Brussels is a small city, it's a kind of a province city but uh, that's only the surface. And then, uh, when you know a bit further about it, Brussels is really the place. This is where the business is taking place. This is where legislation is done. I think the, the figure is around 80% of all legislations which are Touching direct life of European citizens is actually initiated here in Brussels. If you look at Plas Schumann, the epicenter of political power in Europe, you see the European Commission on the one side, next to the Council of the EU. And all around that square you find lobby offices, most of them belonging to big multinational corporations. And you find them also in all of the side streets, all over to the European Parliament and beyond. 
you'll find the, the lobby headquarters of large corporations, you'll find industry lobby groups uh, and their lobby operations being, being orchestrated from offices in that area. 2,500 lobby structures are based in Brussels, 15,000 lobbyists, the second biggest lobby industry in the world. Only Washington DC is bigger. So uh, European Union legislation is, is complicated. It goes through a lot of stages. It always starts with the European Commission. They take uh, new initiatives from the, for legislation, for policies, and then it goes through the institutions, the parliaments, the Council of Ministers. And from the moment that the European Commission takes its very first steps in developing new legislation or new policies, industry wants to be there to influence it. Administration is not really for me, so I really, when I had the possibility to go and work uh, for the private sector, where I would decide myself what I will do, I thought that much more something for me. And then I discovered business around uh, the European institutions. started to, uh, to be a lobbyist. You know, we, everybody believes about the lawmakers are the institutions. And the institutions in the European Union is about the Commission, the Council uh, of Ministers, and the European Parliament. But there is also uh, an, another world behind that, which is how to influence the institutions to make a text, to give a good idea, to uh, uh, propose amendments to uh, try to fine-tune the text depending on the interest that people are willing to push for. In the mid-90s, uh, we had come across so many examples of EU policies that were basically captured by industry and industry lobbying. We felt there's really a fundamental problem here. The influence of industry is, is excessive. And we decided to set up a group to document examples and to start developing a strategy to roll back this excessive influence. But that's how it started. I was working as an environmental campaigner with an NGO in, based in Amsterdam, uh, cooperating with other uh, environmental NGOs across Europe. 
One day in, in the summer of 1993, I remember a fax came in uh, on our fax machine in the office, and it came from the south of France, uh, from a local environmental group. This group was fighting against a, a motorway that was planned to go through a valley in the area they lived, in the Valley of Asp, ecologically very important uh, area, a very beautiful area. The group asked if we knew uh, more about the, the role of, of the European Union and, st and specifically the European Commission in this motorway project. So we started looking into this. We discovered that uh, this motorway project was part of something called the Trans-European Networks. The Trans-European Networks was the, the biggest infrastructure project in history uh, with an uh, estimated budget of 400 billion euro. Friends from Sweden came up with another detail. There was an influential lobby group behind this and they asked us, do you know about the ERT, the European Roundtable of Industrialists? I did not. I started digging for more information about the ERT. I went to our archive and I didn't find anything. I started diving into the alien world of the business press. Newspapers like the Financial Times, The Economist, German business newspapers. And we found a reference to a new report that had been published shortly before called Reshaping Europe. That sounded uh, rather interesting and we ordered uh, this report uh, at the European uh, Roundtable headquarters. I did not believe I would get anything, but a few days later a big brown envelope arrived in my letterbox. Three booklets are inside. I take the first two publications. Missing networks, missing links, going through them, something is strange about them. Eurotunnel, Scanlink, Pyrenees Corridor. Somehow they look so familiar. I go to the archive. The TEN project by the Commission. I go through the papers, I compare them back and forth. What a striking similarity. The projects are almost identical. The Commission seems to have copy pasted the ERT proposals. Now I'm really curious. I take reshaping Europe. Authors, three CEOs. Jérôme Monod, Pierre Gulenhammer, and Wisse Decker. Living in the Netherlands, I knew Wisse Decker. He was the head of Philips, one of the largest companies in the country. Pierre Gulenhammer was the head of Volvo, a car producing company. And Jérôme Monod was the head of Lyonnais des Eaux, a very large French auto multinational. So the authors of this report were uh, three CEOs from some of the biggest companies in Europe. Uh, it was a political manifesto written by these industry leaders. A meeting in Dublin is mentioned. 45 CEOs, all from multinational companies, representing billions of euros of turnover. Companies like Fiat, Lafarge, British Petroleum, Hoechst, Nestle, Shell, Unilever, Siemens, and many others. All of them supporting what is in this book.
But what was stunning was that uh, these these three CEOs would would sit down and actually write a, a report that was a detailed set of recommendations for how to change the the, the, the face of Europe. I finished my job in the Commission in April 1990 and I decided that maybe the best place is actually where the money is, so I went to European Banking Federation. I have worked uh, a long time, uh, nine years, in the European Banking Federation. And I started also to discover uh, an additional word to Europe, which was um, international trade. It was just before the 1992 single market. Jacques Delors at that time was the president and he had really given an, uh, uh, an impetus. Yeah, yeah. But you see, you know, our industry is here, we want to continue to push and we know we have an emphasis uh, that Europe was something and we had a role to play. Uh, and that was really pushing everybody in this city to say there is something that all of us together can do. I think they're very engaged right now. But I think it's it was a feeling that if we go together, we can influence and change the world. I can say that I represent around 80% of all services exporters and investors. And I can say that I represent around 60 million workers. As a turnover, uh, it's, let's say, 50% of the GDP of the European Union. I don't really believe in two chance. Uh, it's part of it but most of the time you will provoke a chance. And then it's going to be up to you to see the opportunity when the chance is there. In December 1993, the NGO network I worked for had its annual meeting, and the meeting was to take place in Brussels. We decided that this was the perfect opportunity to do something a little provoking. The night before, we wrote a press release, and in the early morning, we went to the ERT office. One of us rang the doorbell and told uh, the secretary that uh, he was a student looking for some documents. Uh, when the door opened, we all ran up the stairs quickly, and we all managed to get into the ERT office that way. I remember it very well. I, I was at some meeting in the morning, so I think it was mid-morning, I came into the office and found banners hanging around the office and lots of strange faces around. So I said, what's, what's happening? Will somebody please tell me what's going on? And they said, oh, we've come to occupy your building and um, possibly they wanted a confrontation. Possibly they wanted me to ring up the police and have the police come and throw them out. But it didn't seem to me a good idea at all. Indeed, finally, I, there was some reason, but we had an office lunch, so I took everybody, my people, out to lunch and left them there. We were surprised by the reaction that we got from the ERT. They uh, went off into a room and, and t talked about it, apparently, and decided to leave. And what we did was, um, using the ERT's press lists, we faxed the press release to the international media. 
We expected that the occupation of this very shadowy but very powerful business lobby group would really interest the media. But things went a little bit uh, differently. I think we talked to one newspaper and there was a radio program that was interested but for the rest it was silent. We didn't know when the ERT staff would come back. But on the tables there were position papers and reports lying around. Uh, but there was also a, a very neatly organized archive, everything sorted. So we decided to, to uh, be fast and, and copy as much as possible. In those documents were letters uh, from the ERT and demands from the ERT to European governments and to the European Commission. And there were the responses. showed the degree of access that they had and the incredible influence that uh, was, was uh, clear from those documents. So when we tracked back the history of the ERT, we found that they started in the early 80s. The ERT represents the first time that multinational firms organized purposefully and politically at the European level to try to influence European policy. In the early 1980s, Europe was behind. You had um, a rise in Japan and, of course, a strong United States, and Europe was really concerned about falling behind. What happened, though, actually, is that Per Uhlenhammer of Volvo started talking about trying to find a way to create a Marshall Plan for Europe. Uhlenhammer himself was known as a, a political animal. He loved the limelight. So Uhlenhammer drew up a list of, of heads of multinational firms, of individuals who might come together and come up with some ideas and actually participate in finding a solution for the economic malaise at the time. From the Commission, the, the member of the Commission who was really keen was a man called a Belgian called Stevie Davignon. He had diplomatic and business background. And he could see the need. He said, if I want to talk to European industry, who do I talk to? What I found out when I was a Commissioner for Industry that there was an insufficient contact in between the Commission and the economic operators. The relation which existed was a relation with the federations of industry at, I would say, an official level, but not at the level of the people who were responsible for individual businesses. And I felt that we were missing this. And so we decided to set up a group of industries, which later became the ERT, so as to have the capacity to listen to the CEOs. There were the Agnellis who ran Fiat in Italy. There was Wissedeca who ran Philips in the Netherlands. Um, there was Per Gillenhammer who ran Volvo in Sweden people from Siemens and the big German chemical companies and the French and the Spaniards and then the British. Small number of people who ran the biggest companies in Europe 
and we're ready to talk about big policy issues with those people who were in charge of the European government machine. And then when they meet a visionary president of the commission, right, Jacques Delors, they find Jacques Delors is thinking in entirely the same terms. So why don't they get together and pool their ideas? That's the breakthrough we made. I'm a facilitator. That's probably a good, a good word to put me as a description. Lobbying is uh, always uh, understood as a, a bit of a dirty word, but it's just networking, it's just contact between human beings. very small actually. The people we have to reach out actually at the end of the day it's becoming smaller and smaller. If you know the right person actually you know it's going to be about 100 persons are key persons. The rest are moving around. You know that the, I actually it's next week I have an appointment with uh, uh, someone from the, 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 the Thai uh, delegation, Taiwan delegation and uh, you know, talking uh, to in Brussels, in Brussels, talking about um, the, the, craze, the, the cross trade. Companies are global nowadays, and therefore the American companies, the uh, Chinese companies, the Indian companies, the Taiwanese companies are actually my, my allies. We are working together for the same purpose, which is to open up the market. Hi. Good morning, how are you? Good morning, Pascal. Good to see you yes, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. I have uh, contacts, friends in other countries, and we have actually established a global services coalition. So we're working together to push and put the pressure for the same purpose. Okay. No, I think we can go. Hey, how are you doing? The word lobbying is about actually working in the lobby of a hotel and meeting the people which are going to go in a decision-making meeting. Okay, we're going. Hey, Ivano, how are you doing? <laughs> Hello. 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 Okay, shall we go? Yeah. <laughs> shall we go? You have to be first well informed, consistent, and modest. Uh, the world is changing, people are changing every day, so I'm always very careful in what I'm saying, very careful that what is right today might not be right tomorrow. You're here. It's because we are on the long-term basis. My job is I'm not going to be pretending that I'm going to change the world tomorrow. And the only way for me to deliver is to meet and meet again and repeat and hammer messages. In 1993 was the year when the European Union was born. To us it had been sold as a political project. But these letters that we had found in December pointed in a totally different direction. The files showed that the ERT and the European Commission were meeting on a regular basis.
amazingly jovial and informal. However, all that went on in complete secrecy. The ERT and the European Commission worked hand in hand. In 1984, Missing Links is published, and immediately after, the European Commission sets up a working group with the ERT on exactly this topic. In January 1985, Visse Decker, CEO of Philips, presents his Europe 1990 and his action plan for the single market. Ten days later, Jacques Delors, the new president of the European Commission, gives a speech about the single market in the European Parliament, which sounds like the echo of Decker's speech. In June 1985, Lord Cofield, vice president of the Commission, publishes the famous single market white paper, a copy-paste of the Decker plan. Every six months there was an EU summit. And every six months the ERT met, just a few days before. Location and date were kept confidential. The booking was made two years in advance. They met at that level twice a year. One of them took on the responsibility of arranging the meeting, so often they would meet in some well, fairly nice place. We met once in the Opera House in Milan, we met in a big museum in Germany, we met in a royal palace in London, and they would arrange for the prime minister or foreign minister or whoever to come and talk. Um, and sometimes this is very impressive. When everybody was struggling to join the single currency, I can to this day remember the finance minister of Spain. They were coming into a general election. He said, don't bother. Whoever wins this general election, Spain will do whatever is necessary. It's a terribly strong message. He felt able to speak for the other party as well because he knew that Spain was determined. That kind of thing is very impressive. We talked to a French prime minister who had a lot of doubts about world free trade. One of our people may, may have been a Norwegian, somebody who wouldn't normally get much of a chance to talk to a French prime minister. He said, You've got to do this, Prime Minister. You've got to be part of this free trade movement. And then one of the German chemical people spoke up and said the same thing. We need free trade. European business needs free trade. France must not block it. And you know, I think the French Prime Minister took that seriously. Because no French businessman would talk to him in those terms. Well... I think it's important to see that the European Roundtable was a club of top businessmen and it operated as a club. There were no delegates. They turned up in person, talking to other members at their own level. So it functioned like a club, like any other club, like a church club or a darts club. But when they met, if you put an Italian car manufacturer and a German chemical manufacture together. They discover that they have common problems. They're all worried about barriers to trade. They're all worried about the skill of the young people who are trying to get jobs. They're all worried about the world financial system. And so all the time we're meeting in this way and these people would give 48 hours, which is a lot of time, and then they'd all go home. And we would hope they would spread the message to their own colleagues in their own countries, and to their own governments and their own politicians, and you know, talk more widely about it, saying we need to build a Europe that works better. Because without Europe, we are lost. 
Left behind was a clear message to the following EU summit of the heads of governments a few days later. Adopt the single market, the monetary union, infrastructure projects, a flexible labor market, deregulation, downsized public services, austerity measures, and so on and so on, a whole neoliberal agenda for them. It was the, the message of the ERT, you, you can find that also elsewhere in, in, in kind of business circles. But what we found very scary was uh, the very close cooperation and, and personal links also um, uh, between the European Roundtable and the European Commission uh, in particular. So basically our picture uh, got confirmed by an American scholar uh, stepping into the topic, Maria Green Cowles. I was interested in doing something about Europe and something about the European Union. Here in the United States, we really didn't know much about the single market program until um, business people here in the United States brought it to Congress. And all of a sudden, there was this big discussion about a fortress Europe and that the European community at the time was creating this entity that would prevent American firms from being able to do business there. And it caused me to think, you know, what was the role of business behind the single market program? What I could read and what had been published at the time really had suggested it was largely a government-led initiative. Uh, but once I started asking questions and meeting with different people in Brussels, um, it started a, a whole different story. I started talking with some of the CEOs and then in particular the um, corporate affairs managers of these firms to ask them what happened. And everybody had a little piece of the story. And then I met with Keith Richardson. Keith and I would talk about different things and he would give me some ideas and I'd go and I'd talk with other individuals. And then I'd come back with more questions. And sometimes Keith had the answer and sometimes he didn't. And finally, I believe it was on my seventh meeting with Keith, when I said to Keith, you know, I can write about this, I can have all these different interviews, but I really want to see the pieces of paper. And Keith said to me, well, you know, I have a bunch of cardboard boxes in the basement of the ERT. We haven't opened them. They're from the earlier days. We just we just put this material in the boxes. And of course, you know, in the back of my mind, I was very excited thinking, this is it. Maria Green Cowles came across a telex. It was from Visse Decker, CEO of Philips. In December 1985, he wrote to the heads of state. Just before the signing of the Single European Act, 
which started the process of the single market. The crux of the telex was as follows. You know, we don't know what you're going to do, but we want you to act. You can act one way or another. If you choose not to have a single market program, then you have given us no choice but perhaps take our business elsewhere. This was a clear threat. The ERT represented 60% of Western Europe's industrial output. This was blackmailing. Why did not a single government say anything about the Decker Telex? Or about the other threats that followed? They were our elected representatives. We felt that this was a betrayal and we wanted to do something about it. Uh, it was important for a, a bigger public to know about this and we decided uh, to publish a book. And besides collecting data, we started to make interviews. Undercover interviews. Eric was the, pers the perfect person for doing these interviews. In that time, press accreditation was easy to obtain. A magazine or a journal and you're a journalist. I mean, it was not completely untrue. It was also not completely true. By the mid-90s, the ERT was everywhere. In advisory boards to the Commission, in expert groups, in research institutes, and in think tanks. Some people said it was hardly a lobby group anymore, but already a part of the EU institutions. However, the ERT was only one out of over 2,000 lobby structures in Brussels. We started to dive into the lobby world. Business federations, lobby consultancies, public affairs offices, think tanks. Finally, in spring 1997, we assembled the results of our investigations and interviews into a report. Europe Inc. We scheduled the book launch for the big EU summit in Amsterdam. All the media would be there. We were excited. prepared the book launch and half an hour before the our first friends started arriving but um, very little or no press uh, showed up so yeah that's disappointing we thought we had we had some kind of very exciting material presented in a nice way and uh, yeah clearly it was disappointing that uh, that the media didn't take up that story
very large part of companies investing abroad are actually discriminated towards the local competitors. Sometimes they don't give you the license or they wait very much or they put a lot of taxes. They find ways and means to slow down your business. You are obviously uh, not in a level playing field and, and that is to your disadvantage. So my job is actually about removing these difficulties uh, and sometimes total barriers. When I was a little boy, I remember one of my dearest uh, toy was actually a globe that uh, I've been offered uh, once at, at, at Christmas. And I was looking at this world and all the different countries and I was dreaming about that and I thought, one day I hope I'll be able to travel. <laughs> just concluded the most ambitious market opening and rule making exercise, the strengthening of the rules based system of multilateral trade. And perhaps most important, the establishment of a stronger and more broadly based world trade organization. When I started to work on the financial services GATS negotiations, and that was uh, really a time where I discovered this is really interesting. I'd like, really like to do that. What is interesting in international trade is an international treaty signed by the European Union, even if it is not a European Union legislation is above the European legislation and all countries of the European Union have to respect an international treaty that the Union has signed. We have come to the end of the most far-reaching trade negotiation ever. You, the negotiators of the 117 governments involved, have achieved an extraordinary success. With your approval, therefore, I gavel the Uruguay round as concluded. The internal market of the European Union was becoming a very important market, rich market, with a high GDP per capita, and that when the European Union was going outside and negotiate as a bloc, they had a real power because they were the biggest exporter, the biggest importer, the biggest foreign investor. But so in Britain, the Trade Commission of the European Union was complaining that it was every time he was going to negotiate with the United States, in front of him, he will see his counterpart. Now, I hear you have your office and a garden out here. All sorts of things. And on his back, he will have CEOs of big banks or big insurance companies telling, please do that for me, please do that for us. But when Sir Lynn Britton was turning his back to see where the support was, he was actually having only some ministers saying, don't do this, don't do that, and please do that only, but not more. And he was really not very happy. We discovered that there is a whole world of lobbyists in Washington to tell their government what they want in the trade negotiation. And, and we thought, this is the way we have to go. We have to do something like that. The European institution is asking for it. The, the European institution cannot only rely on the information given by the member states and the experts in the finance ministries, but they need to get the information directly from the, the banks and the insurance companies. The World Trade Organization was planned at a time when there was a wave of privatization around the world. And when there was this dominant thinking that what is good for large companies is good for everyone. Just give them free reign. In October 1997, I was on the train to Paris, on the way to a meeting that would bring together activists from across Europe and around the world to discuss a trade agreement that was negotiated behind closed doors at the OECD. On debate was the Multilateral Agreement on Investments, the MAI, and this was about international investments. Sounds pretty harmless uh, to outsiders probably, but in reality it boiled down to a massive attack uh, and undermining potentially of, uh, of democracy. 
The multilateral agreement on investment was cooked up by some of the world's largest corporations and their associations. And the goal of it was to constrain governments from regulating these big corporations and from regulating capital and investments. It literally constrained governments. It put handcuffs on government regulation and then empowered the corporations with a whole new set of rights to be free from regulation, but also to sue our governments. So this agreement would have meant that governments would have had to compensate foreign companies if they wanted to increase environmental protections, if they wanted better labor standards, if they wanted to secure equal treatment for women, or if they wanted to, to tax capital. The MEI would even have led to companies being uh, compensated for expected profits that they might lose from some new law or regulation. And this goes completely against the logic even of the free market. The negotiations were top secret and behind closed doors until the official proposal by the EU was leaked. It was uh, some Canadian groups that somehow obtained an uh, electronic copy of, uh, of the text. Well, clearly the original source was a democracy-loving civil servant in a government that shall not be mentioned. How it eventually got around is we scanned the text into a website and wrote a commentary on what it meant so that a lay person could actually understand it. When all of this got public, it turned out that several of the European governments didn't even know about it. And then France put up her veto. So business had been so successful in influencing uh, the MAI, MAI rules that this time it was counterproductive. So despite the defeat in the OECD with the MAI talks, uh, Commissioner Liam Britton didn't want to give up uh, this, this project. So he brought it in again under the name M uh, MIA and wanted to launch a similar uh, investment treaty in the WTO talks. Uh, Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think there is a wider degree of consensus on this issue uh, than the protagonists would wish to admit. The fact of the matter is that most people, but not all who have spoken, do see the merits of an international agreement on investment, and they are right to do so. You cannot force investment to take place. You can do what you like. You can shout and you can scream slogans from the sky, but people will not invest unless they believe that there is a possibility to get a return. Now it may well be that the, the scene shifts to the WTO. To achieve that, we have to persuade everybody that there should be a new millennium round, and we have to persuade people that a negotiation on investment should take place in it. Grazie, signor Commissario. So then at a point in time, European Trade Commissioner Sir in Britain decided, I am going to invite for dinner 40 CEOs of the major services companies in Europe. Big banks, big telecom, big insurance, big distribution services, big uh, transport services, big tourism companies. When you take all the different sectors, it is actually making about 70% of the GDP in Europe. So he invited a bunch of 40 of those. Uh, and um, after the dinner, he said, well, now that you've got some some food by the Commission, you, ha you owe me something, you have to do something for me. People sometimes think that the Commission comes up with ideas out of the blue and then pushes them. It's not so at all. The Commission is thirsty for ideas from the economic actors uh, to help us uh, to decide what to put forward, which is in the interests of Europe. It really was, I think, at a time when, when the ERT became more and more present in the city. Uh, it became clear that there was a new way of, 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 of lobbying. But the ERT, from the world I'm coming from, which is the services sectors, uh, didn't represent anybody. 
So it was clear also that if the services sectors wanted to be heard, they had also to bring some CEOs uh, to put their voice loud. Whereas we had strong uh, European bodies pushing for the steel industry, agriculture and so on and so forth, the services were not united and didn't provide a clear voice and advice uh, for the Commission. And I thought it was very important, it was a growing sector, the most important sector, and we needed this advice and I wanted them to provide it. That's the way um, I became Managing Director of the European Services Forum. Let me, let me shake your hand. I'm really sorry. We had 11 months to prepare Seattle. The first WTO uh, ministerial conference after the creation of this organization. And the idea was that this meeting is going to launch the Millennium Round that Southern Britain had so much uh, pushed for. Okay, let's go. The Commission has for a very, very long time uh, taken as its starting point in trade negotiations, the interests of large European companies. So for example, when we would ask for access to Commission documents like correspondence and, and minutes from meetings to reconstruct what was going on with the whole uh, trade debate, the Commission would treat these requests as if they were a hostile act. They would cross out all the essential elements, the things that they would not want us to know about treating us as if we were an enemy. So Lee and Britain never got to Seattle. The entire commission had to resign because of the massive fraud several commissioners were involved in. And in Seattle? The Millennium Round itself took a completely unexpected turn. We were not alone anymore with our concerns. I was based in the Hilton Hotel and uh, the conference was in the Sheraton, 500 meters away. And I have not been allowed to go out of the hotel because there was one protester blocking the door by lying on the ground. And it was a police officer beside him. And I asked him, can I go outside, please? I would like to go and do my job. I was going to assist to the launch of the Seattle round so that we will enter into new phase of negotiation for liberalization of the services. I remember that Commissioner Lamy, he has been able to enter his car, but the car couldn't move because of those people there, just there. And no policeman said, please go away five meters so that the high VIP here can do his job. I have many NGOs saying that ESF is a secret, secret organization having secret meetings with the European Commission, although everything is on our website. I mean, I am doing my job uh, by contacting the Commission uh, officials responsible for my file. If anybody else would like to do the same, their, their, their phone number is on the, in the, on the website. I'm just doing my job and I don't have anything specific, but if the Commission has some relationship with ESF, it is because the Commission is willing to get some information from the services sectors before negotiating on their behalf, because this is what we're talking about. Trade is done by companies, not by NGOs.
this is the annual dinner of the Friends of Europe, which is really a very big Brussels organisation. Lots and lots of people from different countries, different jobs, different walks of life, but who are all interested in how can Europe develop, how can we put right the things that are wrong, and how can we build on what we've already done. And we call it a think tank. Think tanks in Brussels are filling a part of the vacuum that exists at the EU level that there's no European public debates. So the think tanks step into that vacuum and they are the forums in which something like a debate happens inside the Brussels bubble. There are national politicians, there are European politicians, there are civil servants and the dreaded Eurocrats are here, there are diplomats, there are businessmen, there are professors from universities, all sorts of people. One thing about Brussels is it's a bit like a village, everybody talks to one another. When I worked at the ERT, part of my job was to keep into contact. Think tanks are not themselves lobbyists, but they are part of the landscape of lobbying because companies use them to transmit their demands and their, their perspectives. And all of these are heavily dependent on industry funding. Several people are sponsoring it. Microsoft is one of them. American business is present in Europe. Microsoft is one of them. Why not? We have had think tanks in Brussels that were directly funded by the oil industry and that were working to sort out about whether there is such a thing as climate change and whether it's important for governments to act to reduce CO2 emissions. You can set up research institutes to provide you with uh, research that kind of strengthens your position. You can launch massive PR campaigns and flood the media with your information. What also happens is setting up fake NGOs, as happened in the big battle about the software patents law. Suddenly there were these advertisements from an NGO that said it was representing small and medium-sized companies, but the financial backers of this NGO were Microsoft and SAP. In the end, it's all about money. In democracy, it's one person, one vote, but uh, in the Brussels business, it's one euro, one vote. The problem is we don't know about the money behind politics. We don't know how much is being spent on lobbying, by whom and on which issues. We need to get this under democratic control. It has to be made visible what the role is of lobbying in EU decision making. What is the role of a large company like Monsanto or Shell? Or what's the role of, of a foreign government like, like the Chinese or the Russian in, in making decisions in Brussels? We actually have had a lobby disclosure law in the U.S., even though most people don't know this, since World War II. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was worried that Adolf Hitler was trying to lobby Congress to prevent the U.S. from entering World War II. Today's threat to our national security is not a matter of military weapons alone. We know of new methods of attack. The Trojan horse, the fifth column. And as a result, he passed this lobby disclosure law that said, you know, quite simply, if your primary purpose is to influence legislation on Capitol Hill, then you have to register and disclose who's paying you to do that. Sounds simple enough. But even though that was mandatory, it essentially made it a voluntary system. Because that type of definition is, is so subjective. What is one's primary purpose? And as a result, you had nine out of ten lobbyists not registering and not disclosing. When I started working as a Capitol Hill lobbyist in 2002, that was a time when the style of lobbying involved things like gift giving, campaign contributions, fundraising, hiring revolving door uh, persons out of Congress with lucrative jobs. 
And I noticed I just wasn't able to get through to most people. I couldn't even get through to meet with many lawmakers unless I had something to give. So I started preparing legislation to reform the lobbying process. But as you can imagine, no one really was interested in my legislative proposal. What changed everything was this super lobbyist named Jack Abramoff suddenly was caught in the middle of a big major sting operation and he agreed to point the finger at those lawmakers whom he bribed. And as soon as that news broke, my phone started ringing off the hook over in my office. I didn't even have to go visit any legislators anymore. They were calling me saying, you know that reform legislation you were talking about? Could we sign on to that? And at that point, the legislation moved through Congress. It moved very quickly. And this is known as the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act. We had the desire to regulate lobbying for a long time, but in 2004, a new commission came in, and for the first time, 10 Eastern European countries were part of it. When the first Barroso Commission started in autumn 2004, we wrote an open letter to the commission president, to José Manuel Barroso, signed by over 50 NGOs. Muito sinceramente, a confiança que acaba de ser expressa nesta Comissão, dizer-vos que entendo essa confiança como uma grande, uma enorme responsabilidade e que vamos trabalhar, vamos dar o máximo para servir a Europa, para servir as instituições da União Europeia e para servir the response was a very short formal letter, like saying we have received your letter, thank you, very interesting, uh, but no substantial response. So we sent a similar letter to all the vice presidents of the Commission. And suddenly, towards the end of February, we were contacted by the office of Sim Kallas, Commissioner from Estonia, responsible for administration, inviting us to come over. So we went to Mr. Kallas' office, which was uh, somewhere in the top of the building. We didn't know what we had to expect from this meeting. We had never been approached by a commissioner, so in that sense it was very exciting were welcomed by Mr. Kallas himself and one of his cabinet members. And in his hand, uh, Mr. Kallas had a brochure and that made us smile. It was the Lobby Planet Guide to Brussels, which was a, a tongue-in-cheek but very critical uh, look at uh, industry lobbying in the EU, written by Eric and me and our, our colleagues. When I started as an administration commissioner, I really saw that there was a so big suspicion surrounding the decision-making in the European Union. And I, of course, I put uh, a certain, let's say, established for myself a purpose to a little reduce these suspicions. Kallas told us that he was going to launch this European uh, Transparency Initiative, and we immediately saw that it was a big political opportunity. As an outsider to the Brussels business, he also had a clear sense for how the ordinary citizen thought about Brussels. And Sim Kallas took it on with the lobby industry. The European Commission is convinced that the activities of interest representatives are legitimate and offer valuable input in the decision-making process, but things have to happen in a transparent manner. The Commission considers that it is important to know who the interest representatives are, what interests they represent, and against what financial background. 
I put a lot of, uh, I'd say, efforts to to create this speech or to make this speech, and uh, and uh, <coughs> this, um, of course, um, outlined main principles of transparency initiative, which should be done, and it was, uh, of course, met um, with excitement and lot of controversial reactions. Ohne finanzielle Transparenz können wir nie herausfinden, wer wirklich hinter den Kampagnen steckt. When is a lawyer a lawyer and when is a lawyer a lobbyist? Let mere control med os selv skader ikke vores omdømme i vælgerbefolkningen. La transparencia no tiene que impedir nuestro contacto con la vida, con los grupos de interés o los grupos de no interés. Gracias, estoy seguro que el comisario Callas lo entiende. European Union was considering the European Transparency Initiative. They were looking for some advice as to how some of these achievements happened in the U.S. and as a result I was brought out about half a dozen times to testify before the European Commission and the European Parliament. So one of my first testimonies before the European Commission was a very, very awakening experience. I had one commissioner interrupt me and say, well, we understand you've had a problem in the United States with lobbying activities and Jack Abramoff. But he went on to say, but you know, this is Brussels and this is Europe. We don't have that kind of activity going on here. We don't have Jack Abramoff in Europe, which just kind of floored me uh, that anyone could be so naive as to actually believe that. My more perhaps effective answer was, okay, I'll concede that a lot of these K Street lobbyists and the professional lobbyists here in the United States may be corrupt. However, I know every major K Street lobby shop also has a lobby shop in Brussels. And so we're in your bed, Europe. Don't you want to know? If you think that we are so corruptible and so corrupting, don't you want to know who we are and who's paying for us and what it is we're trying to get you to do for us? To tell the truth, I was very impressed with Sim Collis when I first started working with him in the European Commission. Sim Collis helped really usher the whole significance of needing transparency. But halfway through the process, Sim Collis came up against political realities. After three years of struggle and political fight, an exhausted Commissioner Callas entered the stage to finally launch a lobby register. Okay, good. Good noon. Noon. Or afternoon. Uh, so, um, quite a remarkable moment today. Uh, three years ago, I proposed to set up a register of lobbyists in order to enhance transparency and and legitimacy around the EU decision-making process and the register opens from today. So we proposed voluntary solution because I was, I am, I am convinced that this would, would shoot for all, all expectations. And I, I think that today is a, is a very important moment of cultural change um, concerning this um, this aspect of decision making in European institutions. Simcalas introduced a voluntary system against all recommendations by NGOs and experts. This was the best he could get. We have tried for over two years now to find out 
who had blocked Callas's original intention. Were it other commissioners, the commission secretariat, the lobbyists themselves? We don't know. But shortly after, at the annual award ceremony of the lobby industry, the winner of the think tank of the year had a clear message for Mr. Callas. After the financial crisis started in October 2008, José Manuel Barroso appointed the Independent High-Level Group on Financial Supervision. The group was to work out proposals for the regulation of the financial markets and to find a way out of the financial crisis. Eight so-called wise men were appointed to this group. Jacques de la Roche, Rainer Macera, Ono Rüding, Otmar Ising, Callum McCarthy, Leszek Balcerowicz, José Pérez Fernández, and Lars Nuber. We looked into the independence of this independent group and we found some astonishing things. De La Roche is the co-chair of a financial lobby organization. Macera is linked to Lehman Brothers. Rüding to Citigroup. Ising to Goldman Sachs. McCarthy, Nuber and Balcerovic are notorious deregulators. And Perez Fernandez works to provide financial market intelligence to big banks. Three of the eight were directly linked to American banks, all of which were directly involved in causing the crisis. Balcerovic, in addition, is closely linked to American right-wing think tanks like the Cato Institute which was one of the closest advisors to the Bush administration. He was also involved in neoliberal think tanks in Brussels, in Poland and the UK. Not a single of these wise men uh, was in favor of strict regulation. Not a single one of them was really independent. And the effect of these eight wise men on overcoming the financial crisis was zero. The main thing that happened was that a lot of public money was flowing to the banks. Yes. This whole affair has a horrible sense of déjà vu. The same financial institutions that were bailed out with taxpayers' money are now making a fortune from Greece's misfortune, while those same taxpayers are paying the price 
in deep cuts to their salaries and social services. After 20 years of deregulation and liberalization, suddenly the European Union herself was at the edge of being blown up. What is at stake is not only the European Union, but also democracy and the future of the values that we hold dear. Was it this what we Europeans had wanted? Was it really naive to have a European dream? It is in the human nature that you have not only good, you always have a bad side somewhere. And we need to make sure that we keep only the good, and therefore you need regulation. When you live in a society, you have rules, because otherwise people are going too fast on, on, on the motorway, because people are not respecting the others, because the stronger takes this place. This is, this is the human nature. What we have done to go and, and make sure that we live together is by creating legislation, is by, by creating an authority that everyone respects.